Uh, we've come to our last speaker, and I've been waiting all day to, to introduce Norman because obviously he's going to be dealing with electricity, so you know, it's a bright spark, and this is going to be very powerful, and it's going to plug various gaps. That, you know, no, it's power. not. It's not going to do any of that. <laughs> the, the one thing is, I don't know an awful lot about electricity, except I do know, in terms of it being hazardous, that it is one of the most powerful um, because it, it's like fire, it's unforgiving. If you get it wrong, you don't get a second chance. So, you know, it was great when Norman said, yep, yeah, I'm more than happy to come and talk about, um, you know, electricity and let people see. Um, and I've got to admit, when it comes to diploma questions and diploma papers, that's the question most people avoid, like the plague. So, you know, without much more ado, Norman, we'll look forward to it. Thanks very much. Indeed. Thanks very much, Tom. Brilliant handover. Um, yeah, it is dangerous. Uh, it is an explosive force. Why should that be? Electricity is a form of energy. It only becomes a form of power when you make it do something. It's the old, old level physics question. What is power? Power is a measurement of the consumption of a force of energy. And believe it or not, energy can't explode. And later on in the presentation, we're going to get there. This is a very much an oblique view of electricity. I think the secret there is in the title. When there's none, when there's some, and when there's massive amounts. But before I actually start the presentation, which isn't that long, to be honest, you just need to know a little bit about my background and why I've taken this oblique view. I started my career as an electrical engineer in Newcastle in the late 70s when I was an electronics technician in a lab. I worked basically in a large technical college. I did a formal apprenticeship because I only worked there for 18 months with a company called Redifusion Northeast. And I suspect, looking at the um, average age in the room, some of you may remember Redifusion. They were the people who provided cable TV. If you didn't have it, you may have had somebody like an aunt or a gran who did. You basically got your TV signal through a selector switch on the wall. You didn't need a TV aerial. Anyway, I moved on from there and I spent six years in local radio. I was a senior engineer at Metro Radio. Left Metro Radio in 1983, came to Cumbria, and joined ITV Border as a technician. I then carried on my career for a further 26 years, and I ended up as the head of operations at <coughs> ITV Border. And the reason I say it's an oblique view, because uniquely, although I was an electronics engineer, and I dealt with electricity at all different voltages, I very much worked in the media. My whole career, basically, whether it was cable, radio, or TV, I was always working alongside journalists, people who covered the news, people who wrote the headlines. And that's the core to this presentation. Because really, I want, what I want you to do, I want you to start thinking about the headlines. I want you to transpose the position and think, if, if, if this happened to you, if this was your employer, what would you do in this situation? And this is the first headline, when you've got no electricity. These headlines, uh, when I was doing the research for this short presentation, are, they're, they're in abundance. In fact, when Tom started, if you can remember uh, way back to this morning when Tom gave his introductory speech, he talked about being north of the border and he heard the announcement that the schools were being closed. Funny enough, I thought he was going to go down the line because at 10 o'clock last night when I was watching the BBC news, they said there was no trains running between Newcastle and Edinburgh because of high winds affecting the pantographs and the electric trains. It's funny enough, he turned it around and did the schools. It's not uncommon to see these sort of headlines this day and age. These three, which I just picked at random, came from 2010, 2011. 31,000 homes without power in Scotland. Reasons below in black. Power cuts shut off M8 in Glasgow. Flooding in Lancashire leads to travel disruption. The strange thing, the way this news is presented is, the, t the, the news gatherers tend to go for the bigger figure. They tend to go for the 31,000 homes. They tend to go for the, oh, the M8, it's a major archery. They don't talk about the disruption to industry. They don't talk about the number of hours lost on the production line. They don't talk about the inconvenience to possibly you or your employer. Why? It, one, is probably difficult to get down to the figures to accurately predict what the losses were incurred by industry. Second, it's not a headline grabber. You've just heard Neil talk about the work at height statistics and the, how quick the media were to take a very negative stance on one person's view, and then the company had to invest highly in terms of energy to try and correct that message out there. But unfortunately, this is not uncommon. It's the headline grabber because they go for the numbers. What I want you to start thinking about is, what if 
you were on the same electrical distribution circuit of any one of those situations, what are you going to do or what's your employer going to do in terms of continuity? I'm going to tell you a story. 2005, Cumbria was underwater. It's rather an iconic picture I've borrowed from the BBC website. That is Carlisle Civic Centre. Um, it happened very quickly. And I know it happened very quickly because I was at work. Funny enough, we've covered work at height a lot today. Um, and if, funny enough, it was an incident to do with work at height, or it could have been, that actually got me into border TV at four o'clock in the morning when the floods were starting. Just wind the clock back, it was a Friday night. There'd been three days of heavy rain over the Pennines. The National River Authority had not given the relevant wardens that the amount of water coming off and down to Eden could cause problems. Over the Friday night, wind speeds were averaging 70 mile an hour, gusting at 80 mile an hour. And on Saturday morning, on a balmy day, not unsimilar to today, the city found itself with that level of water careering through the city <coughs> center. I'd been called in at four in the morning. We had an alloy self-erect scaff tower turned up with two fitters to put new windows in on the Friday. I was leaving work at seven o'clock and I found these two guys in the car park and asked what they're up to. So we're just going up to look at the windows that will be changing. I said, no, you're not. I want you to park the scaffolding and go home. I'll meet you here at 8.30 tomorrow morning and we'll review the situation because the forecast is not good. If the winds continue as they are, you're not going up there, regardless of the contract saying you've got to work the weekend to replace the windows. What I hadn't done, what had been remiss, I didn't tell them where to put the tower. The call I got at four in the morning was from the security guard saying, Norman, the scaffold tower's blown over. It's leaning against an overhead catenary. Oh. Right, I better get to work. I knew fighting against the rain and the wind when I got there, I was going to have a bit of a job on my hand. Fortunately, the catenary I was talking about was nothing more than data cables. The alloy tower, <coughs> and with the wind speeds, and there's not a lot of, you know, substance to an alloy tower to catch wind. There's only two platforms on there. It had successfully moved at four or five meters, blowing the thing over. Ironically, the head of news had also taken a call at the same time. And he'd rang a cameraman and said, um, I'm getting reports, Carlisle is flooding. Everybody's in their beds and doesn't know about this. Everybody's battened down, basically, because of the high winds. I managed to get the tower at least tethered so it wouldn't go any further. I tied it to a porter cabin, believe it or not. I was trying to stop it falling over. I was asked by the head of news to hang around uh, on the basis that, look, they may be coming back with some video. We've got to get this down to one of the major news gatherers, ITN. I can't tell you how astounded I was when he returned within an hour to show me pictures of one of the main roads into Carlisle, Warwick Road, and there was an ambulance with its flashing lights still going. I wish me Peugeot had such good electronics, and it was floating down the high street. I'd not seen pictures like this before. I'd worked through Lockerbie. I'd worked through foot and mouth. I'd worked through Grey Rig Rail disaster. Seeing ambulances floating down your high street was something I had never witnessed. Um, we went very quickly to having no electricity. It happened at 11 in the morning, pretty much 11. When you lose your electrical supply, your first reaction is the lights have gone out because they tell you. You then start looking around to see, well, look, is it just the, electri the electrical light in the circuit or is this something else? No, quite clearly this was something else. The pictures tell a story. The level in most houses, the, the downstairs were certainly wrecked. People were now being rescued by inflatable cra craft from the Inshore Rescue Association. And this was in the middle of town, 3,000 houses. What had happened by 11 o'clock was the substation that feeds Carlisle, it had flooded too. So the whole of the city was in darkness. I should emphasize at this point, it wasn't just Carlisle. It was right across the Cumbria. Appleby, Cockermouth, uh, Keswick, areas were affected. But Carlisle just effectively went into a city of darkness. Um, hard to believe that we didn't have any early warnings. So we now had a situation where, as a broadcaster, we had this fantastic national story happening right on our doorstep and no way of getting the signal out. Couldn't feed the transmitter. We couldn't even get the pictures that we carried on news gathering to anybody who might be interested because effectively the station had no supply. However, we had in our back pocket 
a thing called the ITV Business Continuity Plan. I apologise for the date, by the way. ITV had a peculiarity with some of their documents that when they put them out there in template form, the date on the front page automatically updated at the last opportunity you looked at them. This document, I promise you, was not written in 2006. It was written prior to 2005. Um, and there I am. As head of operations for ITV Border, I was the author of it. 50 pages of well thought out what are we going to do if such an incident should occur. Actually, it wasn't a lot of use to us. When, you, when you're in a predicament when you've got 3,000 homes flooded, no idea when the electricity supply might be connected, and you've written a document that you thought was well thought out, even though you may have wargamed it with your nearest neighbour, which happened to be ITV Tynes, it became worthless pretty quick. Didn't appear that way. When I authored it, and when I presented it to the management team, and it was fairly thorough in most respects, it, it, it outlined areas of responsibility, it outlined areas of um, who would be on the immediate response team, we catered for such things as landline numbers, mobile numbers, or I had, because I was the author of the document, it catered, and it, I, I just looked at this only this week, I, can't, I left employment of ITV back in 2009, but I still have a copy of this on my computer, and there, there was things like, um, Establish good communication with emergency services if such circumstances apply. I think they do. We've got 3,000 houses underwater and no electricity. Um, it goes on to talk about assess what assets would, might, may be recoverable. Uh, we had our assets. We just couldn't make them work. They were all intact. There was nothing wrong with them. Well, we, we thought there was nothing wrong with them. We just couldn't power them up. It is a frightening how quick you feel hopeless in such a situation. Um, people were ringing me, or attempting to ring me, uh, to ask if we needed assistance. They clearly knew that some people would be at ITV border, but it also became quite clear there were other difficulties, and it wasn't just to do with the shortage of electricity. In terms of communication, some of the surprises, ITV border had fantastic um, connectivity. We had fibre optics apart from the BBC, is one of the only two employers within the city. We had no less than 10 landlines into the building and 10 outgoing lines out of the building. However, what we'd not considered in our business, or certain people hadn't considered in the uh, business continuity plan is, without main supply to the switchboard, you go down to one telephone, and that's it. So we had one landline, one landline only working. This came as a real surprise to me, Mobile phone uh, networks failed within two hours. So all that work that we put in on the documentation in terms of this is how we will contact people and under normal circumstances, the landline number, this is the emergency number, we can get them on the mobile, were rendered useless. A few mobiles could still connect because there were certain networks and pockets around the city where mobile ne connectivity was usable. Um, also became unusable quite quickly because if you were reliant on one mobile to try and stay in touch with everyone, the battery goes on it pretty quick. How are you going to recharge it? This was another surprise. The footprint of ITV border was 10,000 square meters, although that wasn't its occupancy, that was just the full site size. The building itself was built in the 50s, built on multiple floors. It was a big building. We dragged a few members of staff in by midday and believe it or not, one of the things that hampered us was just communication around the building. Because again, without the switchboard working, you couldn't ring another office number. Never mind connectivity, no internet, no, no web access. You can't telephone your neighbour, who may only be at the end of the corridor, but it does start causing problems when you're trying to keep things running. And I have to say, the head of news had taken an early decision in this scenario to carry on as a news gatherer, regardless of not being able to see the pictures coming back in the building. So effectively what he was doing, he was tasking the journalists with the camera people to go out there, gather the news and take notes of where they'd been, the names of the people they'd interviewed, the time of day and the location and bring it back. All we could do was sit on that tape and do very little else with it. No internet and no email I've already mentioned. Disruption to transport, I mentioned it affected Cumbria. Um, it was rather important because due to the clear lack of communication, due to the lack of communications, it became difficult to determine what roads were open. East-west travel for anybody who lives in the area is difficult enough at the best of times through Carlisle. With the city centre underwater, it became impossible. Um, many roads were underwater, east-west I've already mentioned. Travel was severely limited by the amount of fuel available. The power stations had it, they couldn't pump it. It was this bizarre situation where we had fuel on site in minimalist form for things such as um, 
uh, garden equipment. It was actually no use to it because we had a fleet of diesel vehicles. You've got to get to a petrol station or they can get it. The nearest we could find, and they really did play a pivotal role, were the fuel stations on the motorways, north and south. As you, could, you, could, you could give a crew a break and send them for a hot coffee. You could ask politely of the manager there if you could plug your mobile phone in to charge it, and you could buy some diesel at the station on the way. So it became quite an important uh, artery for us. The workplace issues were big. We, an aging building, two large gas supply boilers, uh, however, without the electricity, we couldn't make the pumps work. So the building was losing temperature pretty quick. Due to the lack of lighting, when it got to four in the afternoon on day one, which was the Saturday, it actually became dangerous to move around. The only torches we had were the sort of large lanterns that the normal one security guard who would be on duty had. A big headache dawned on us at about four in the afternoon. I've just put my, my card in my pocket, but basically, visitors would be given these type of cards, but we had a swipe card system um, on all exits from the building. They had an embedded chip in them, so we could know who was going in and out of the building. However, in advancement of technology, we'd taken all the normal locks off the building. We now had a large, unlit, unheated building that we couldn't secure. Not to mention the fact that the compound that the building sat in had a high link wire fence with an electronic gate that we had to either wedge open or wedge closed. The problem with that is we had other buildings within the compound that we rented out to CFM. They would need 24 hour access, although they were off air just like ourselves. What I'm coming to in this is we limped along. We actually got through the night by, we would normally have only had one security guard on duty. But we had to supplement that guard because we deemed that the risk to one person and the footprint of the site, it just, you know, we were not comfortable. Um, so we supplemented in short shifts the one security guard who should be on duty. We had gas, we could heat, we could heat water so we could get a hot drink and that was about it. On the Sunday morning, the MD who turned up, uh, said we need to now think long term. Uh, we'd gone through day one, 24 hours later. Is there any way we can bring the building back to life, notwithstanding the fact that the electricity suppliers weren't giving us any true information on when the supply should be reconnected? The, te the technical team at the time consisted of myself as head of operations in terms of electricity supply. I had a foreman electrician with me and one electrician. We'd already preempted the MD, although it wasn't in the business continuity plan, we'd already done the back of an envelope calculation on the size of generator that would be required to get the building back up and running. It's a tricky question because you've got to start thinking and ask just to put yourself in a similar situation if you were in this predicament because if you only do part of the building, which part do you do? You know, you'll have heads of all departments coming to you making claim that they need electricity just as importantly as another department. Clearly the news gathering operation, yeah, that, that has to be up there as a priority. But you can't do that as a half measure. If you get the mains on to the building, do you have to then consider, do you get the studios up and running and they do consume a phenomenal amount of electricity? The sales team would then be anxious that they're losing revenue, they would have to talk to the potential customers because it was a commercial operation. Program makers would have the same charge and on and on. We came to the conclusion, the only way to do it was to get a generator in the, of the size that would satisfy the demand of the building which turned out to be 500 kVA. That's a pretty big generator. I'll give you some idea. Anybody be at the fairground and you see um, a, fair, a standard fairground ride, if it's a, a small to medium generator and it's on the back of the truck that the fairground ride comes on, that is about 30 to 50 kVA. If they're towing the generator, there's a good chance it's going to be about 50 to 100 kVA. We needed 500 kVA. It's a big generator. As you can see, it comes in a, she a sea shipping container, and it's on wheels, and you can't get it off, so you've got a problem parking it up. But there are massive considerations before you go down this route. First off, you've got to find one. I knew where to look. I knew from my previous experience working for Metro Radio and the amount of outside broadcasts I'd done that there's a company over in the northeast called Agreco. Um, you will see some of their generators in this area, actually, because they are known as suppliers of large generators. I rang a friend, 
on the one working phone, who was the head of operations at ITV Tintees, and I said, can you get hold of the Greco and ask them, do they have a generator? Great, they've got a generator. The problem is, demand had been so high for such big plants, they didn't have any HGV operatives who still had driving time because of the tackle who could get it to us on that morning. They could probably get it to us in the afternoon. Facilities may not exist for connection. We did have them. We had existing connection facilities within our plant room where the electricity supply came into the building. We'd already catered for an instance like this, maybe not of the size, but we'd already thought about, can we substitute and change over from a supply of electricity to an emergency standby one and do it in a safe manner? Did we have competent persons? Yes, we ticked all the boxes on that. I had a charge hand electrician, and I had an electrician with me who actually had already installed and modernized the very plant room we'd want to connect the generator up to. I'll come back to the required fuel because this goes on once the thing is running. Go back to the generator. The generator duly arrived, not ideal timing, three o'clock on the Sunday afternoon. This was simply because the drivers weren't available and they didn't really with the, right, the, right, the, the, the hours. Um, the first problem is, it isn't easy discernible, but the cables, they come on drums that you can't take the cable off. What I can best describe is, you've got to make four connections. It takes four cables. And if anybody remembers hose reels inside of buildings for internal firefighting, that's about the diameter of the cable that you're going to have to connect up times four. Our first problem was, we had ample car park space to put the generator in loca on location, and we knew we couldn't get it off its wheels, but on seeing the site of the cables, we had to get them into the building. Now, we'd made provision, just as we had for the connection to get cables in, but nothing of the size that it, this machine arrived with. Effectively, at three in the afternoon, the first electrician was tasked with knocking bricks out the wall. We had to break into our own plant room to connect the cables. That was issue number one. That took some time, and it led to the first accident. Led to the first accident about seven in the evening. The winds had picked up again, the rains had returned. We decided that for lots of reasons and ease of connection, the bricks would have to come out at a reasonable height. We got the bricks out in a safe manner. Um, I was pulling the cables off this drum here. The, forehand, the, the charge hand electrician was pulling the cables out to form a snake. And the electrician put the cable over his shoulder, like a fire hose, climbed the ladders he'd used to get up to make ac the access hole, and forgot that as he climbed up the ladders, the weight increased and he was pulled off backwards. Fortunately, he landed on grass and he was fine. We soldiered on with these four industrial cables, and we actually got the thing under the bus bars in a safe manner, connection, 10 o'clock in the evening. It had been two very, very long days. Um, connection looked safe. We put the breakers in the right place. We had the building offload. We'd also taken precautionary measures. We'd gone, with the help of the IT technician, right around the building and just made sure, remember I said it was disconnected, just as a subtle disconnect. It wasn't a big bang, it's just you, we lost the electricity. Uh, the problem is we didn't want that full load on the generator when we started it up. And that was the next surprise. 10 o'clock in the evening, pitch black. We climbed the ladders here to get into the end compartment where the generator was started from. Now the generator breaks down into three neat packages. You've got nothing more than a, something like a, a very reliable diesel engine at one, one end, and on the same shaft or axle it's driving an alternator, which is making a lot of noise once it's up and running, and here you have a control room that effectively allows you to stop, start, and, and look at the voltages that it's generating. There was a clue to the amount of noise that was going to be in this compartment when the three of us, myself, the charge hand electrician and the electrician climbed into it because there were some air defenders hanging up. But I'll also tell you, has anybody, ever, has anybody ever hired a steam wallpaper stripper? And you get, when you go to hire a wallpaper stripper, the hirers generally give you a piece of A4 laminated. On one side will be the health and safety requirements, and on the other is the operating instructions. And I kid you not, this is a 500 kV generator, and there's one of these hanging up in the cab. And I took it down, and I thought, that's interesting. <laughs> I've read the health and safety instructions, I should know about them anyway. Here's the start of procedure. And it was just like you see on the science fiction movies press button A, move lever B. There was a loud bang and a clatter, and I looked behind me, and the two electricians were out the door. There was a phenomenal noise. They just exited very quickly. 
I looked at the gauges to see what was happening, decided to shut it off, and I thought, that's interesting. I didn't expect that, looking down at the two electricians stood below me. But I thought, no, 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 you've got to bear in mind this is a coal, this is just a diesel engine. You know, have ever seen a commercial van when it started up in the morning and they see the black smoke come out and it's, it, it's going, it's, ha it's got a lot of work ahead of it, it's turning a big alternator and it's off load. That is probably what we expect. Climb back on board with the two electricians looking through the door and I started it again and I registered the dials. Yes, it was running. Yes, the voltage was correct. It was the frequency that was very unstable. Now, believe it or not, the electricity that comes out of these supplies and these sockets, if you look at the major generators of electricity, they get regular slaps on the wrist. And believe it or not, there's a, quite a window in terms of the voltage that they can deliver to your living room or to your place of work. The one that the regulator is very uncomfortable with is the frequency that this mains comes out of the sockets at. And if you just go online and look at the recent slaps on wrist by the regulator, it tends to be for frequency. And that's what was happening. The generator hadn't actually got up to its frequency and was doing its job properly. Confidence level a bit more up there. Hung the instructions back on the wall. We started it and we got connection. Once it was stabilized, that was 10 o'clock on the Sunday evening. It ran effortlessly right away through till we switched it off on Thursday morning. We didn't, I mean, once we shut the compartment door and the staff started to come back to work at 5.30 on the Monday morning for the early shift for JMTV news bulletins, it did its job fantastically. But we had other issues. We had other issues because down here, there was, you know, we'd started the damn thing. It came with a tank of fuel, but this is a 500 kV generator. Is this going to take more than your average five litre fuel can and carry it in the boot of your car to keep it going? And I already mentioned that the petrol stations in the area didn't have electricity. So once again, you have to start thinking, well, where are we going to get the diesel from to keep this thing going? Um, and it wasn't cheap. There was a minimum hire period of two days, and it was £3,000 a day to bring it on site. I was fortunate. I had a competent team around me who could make the connection. The reason I've been through that story wasn't nostalgia. It goes back to that original three headlines I, tr I showed you. You know, the, the banner headlines the media go for, the number of houses. This is quite an extreme case, a city underwater, a county where uh, communications and transport is difficult. But unfortunately, and Ray played light, you know, about Google, it does happen frequently. You saw the news last night. Northern Rail Networks couldn't run trains, and I doubt if they'd go down this route. It's just too much of a challenge. But it's something you've got to consider. Business continuity, disaster recovery. And it's easy, very easy, to author a document and not realize the implications of just the impact of not having the beauty of flicking a switch on a wall. That's about it for the banner headlines in terms of what can you do when you haven't got electricity? Sounds an easy option, we'll get a generator in. They're fraught with difficulty. Why do we keep it running till the Thursday? Just a final point before I go through these ones. Um, the electricity suppliers, they, they do a rather ruthless test. So the, the, the city had been underwater and clearly all the cables were adversely affected. Water would be possibly in them. And there were some areas of Carlisle didn't get the mains electricity back on in a stable fashion until the Monday evening. Some didn't get it till much later in the week because certain cables had been damaged and needed replacing. If There are several things you can do with a damaged cable if it's had water in it. You can connect the electricity and hope that it'll survive. You can connect the electricity and if it doesn't survive, the breaker will come out. And what you then have to do is send a team with a cylinder of pressurized inert gas, generally nitrogen. And what they do is, they seal the end of the cable, they disconnect the cable, they connect a hose to it, and they force the moisture out. I've seen it done with a nitrogen supply to hopefully remove the moisture. The majority of the cables had actually survived. They worked. So what happened was there was pockets of Carlisle that were being connected and disconnected that occasionally was disconnecting the main supply. They're called brownouts. A blackout is when you get a final and fatal loss of supply. A brownout is, is aggressive on IT equipment. It's where you lose the supply, it's out for a minute, and it comes back on unexpectedly. It really does hit IT equipment. In the period of the Munda, where we had gone back to mains connection, we lost 18 pieces of individual IT equipment around the building. 
through brownouts. So we just took the decision to go back to the generator and ran it through till Thursday. The second sort of grabbing headlines that had come to my attention, and again, as I said, I'm coming at this rather obliquely because I'm an electrical engineer who happened to work in the broadcast sector for over 30 years. EDF announces energy price rise, last of the big six crumbs. That means the, the other five have already announced them. Figures are four and a half to 15 and a half percent. 15th of September, 2011. I was amazed when this came out for the lack of reaction. Everybody was talking about downturn in the, in the economy. Everybody was talking about Euro what was happening in Europe. Everybody was talking about the money shortage. Nobody commented on the fact that there seemed to just be a general acceptance that potentially, the figure crept up beyond this, that there could be, industry could be hit with an 18% increase on its fuel bill. Thought that was bad enough. Kind of came in the news, it was on the headlines, and no comment from many industry leaders when this one came out. 23rd of November, 2011. Electricity costs to rise due to government policies. In its annual energy statement, the Department of Energy and Climate Change and government policies would increase the cost of electricity. Now, the trap here is that is on top of that. So if you've got a 15% energy increase this winter, what these people are predicting is it's 15% more this time around, but actually it's going to be nearly 30% on top of that by the time we get to that 2020 date. The other surprise is, when you start looking around at the government agencies, there's help there if you're a consumer. There's still grants available for you to help yourself put extra insulation in. That I cannot find a government website or a government statement which is offering a lifeline to industry. No one's talking about it. It's at the back of their mind in terms of the uncertainty in the markets. Crumbs, that's without this further compounding the problem. So I thought it might just be worth look at some of the issues to do with the workplace and what you can suggest may help offset some of those increases. There have been massive advances and most of you are aware of them. So I just put these up in a very, very pretty form. Energy issues, lighting. Install lightning controls. Daylight occupancy controls. Ensure your lights are only on when required. I think we're all pretty fair with them now. These are the ones that... There used to be a time when there were cumbersome systems to install. They were like old-fashioned burglar alarms. You tend to have a sensor in one place, wired up to something that brought the lamp on in the area that the person walked into. They've massively improved. You can get them incorporated in the light fitting now so that actually the changeover cost and the changeover time is quite small. Notwithstanding the issues of work at height, you bring somebody in who just changes the light fitting. It's got a sensor in it. It just means as long as it's not on a fire exit route or an important exit point or a place where you think, such as a landing on a stairs that should be lit permanently, you have lighting that's sensitive to occupancy. Automatically controls by sensing when an area is occupied. It just tells you how it works. Likely to be savings opportunities in a building where the lighting is left on unnecessary. The Carbon Trust estimate you could save up to 30% of your lighting costs. So step one, we've got no choice. You've got to fit energy efficient lights these days. Step two, it's worth taking back at least as a suggestion to your workplace. Bearing in mind the previous headlines was all about the percentage increases and they're just going to go up. There's potential savings if you look at the way you're managing your light. Second area, the real biggie. That is notwithstanding any electricity you might be consuming for the operations of whatever you're doing at work. Improve heating controls, install optimum start-stop and weather compensation. Sounds big, it's not. Optimum start controllers, suitable for all systems. Basically what they do is, unlike your thermostat at home, which just registers, or your work, current workplace, where it just registers the temperature internally, an extra control gets fitted. And basically, it takes a difference between the temperature inside the building and a temperature out. And as we've seen this week, we've had some pretty balmy weather, where it's been quite a mild day today, and then we had sleep the day before. So an optimizer just helps balance out the difference. 
I mean, you, get, you see it all the time. It's generally the chatter in the office first thing in the morning when people come in. Oh, it's warm in here today, or it's cold outside. They either flip it one way or the other. The optimizer, not expensive, fairly easy to fit. Again, I've got the figures from the Carbon Trust who seem to be taking a leading role in evaluating the impact of energy efficiency on industry, because I can't find it anywhere else on the government websites. That it's, They state that an optimum start-stop control can provide 10% efficiency improvement, and both these controls usually pay back their investment within a couple of years. If you take into account the two headlines I showed you earlier on, already if we're looking at a 16% increase this year, and they're predicting um, near enough 30% increase by 2020, this is a good time to consider this. Or take it back to your workplace and say, look, there is a potential way to offset some of these increases coming in our direction. The optimizer doesn't work necessarily the same way on all systems. You just need to have somebody in with some expertise to tell you whether you can do it on your system because unfortunately, if you're reliant on your heating through the air conditioning as much as you're cooling, it's a bit more difficult to do, but it can be done with water-fed systems or electrical systems. Um, this is a massive, massive growth area in energy saving. The first fact is um, tubed monitors tend to be a thing of the past. Anybody who's moving towards IT investment and refurbishing tend to now be going towards the flat panel type. Simple statistic, they consume a lot more electricity than a tube type. Go back 10 years, you had a tube TV set in your living room, it consumed less than the modern plasma screen. However, the modern plasma screen does offer you a lifeline to offset that consumption because they invariably come with software that allow you to manage how they're being run. Like in the days or the annoying days of Windows 98 that used to shut down on you when you didn't use it for half an hour, you can actually set the monitor settings such to go into sleep mode for all energy econ or economy mode when it knows it's not being used. So the manufacturers of these things have actually thought about this and they've, they've realized that inadvertently companies are actually taking on more in terms of the, of the cost of running IT equipment but they're trying to offset it, but it's up to you to manage it. Leaving computer monitors and um, photocopiers on, on standby, even when they're switched off at weekends and holiday periods, can cost small and medium-sized office-based businesses £350 a year. It's difficult to get down to what does all that mean. It's difficult to quantify what effect it might have in your workplace because you probably come from very, very diverse industries. But certainly, in an organization with 10 or more employees, it's worth looking at. Can't do it on your own. You can't go in there. It's going to need the collaboration of the workforce. You're going to need cooperation. So it's a good subject matter to bring up either a health and safety forum, a, an environment forum, or discussion with the trade unions. Get the staff to buy in to checking their own monitor settings. If you've got a team of six people who are using a communal printer or a photocopier, and there's one diligent person who's switching it off at the weekends, you're not going to reach this figure. It's going to need a team effort to make sure that there's a shared responsibility, it's collective, that everyone is making sure that this stuff is switched off in an evening when it's not in use, at a weekend when it's not in use, and somebody has looked at the menu settings to say that it's in economy mode to show that it's going to shut down on its own accord after non-use of 30 minutes. It's the only way you're going to get to this figure. But I'm afraid it's the only lifeline I can give you to offset what the forecasting of the costs. The people who are at the forefront, I've already mentioned this, the Carbon Trust are doing some very good work. I had a couple of slides in here before I come across this very short video. And it's just worth watching this very well-made short video done by the Carbon Trust. The electricity consumed by office equipment typically represents in the region of 15% of your total energy consumption. This video has been produced to assist you in identifying and implementing basic office equipment energy saving measures in your business. Computers and monitors Encouraging your staff to switch off computers and monitors should be your first step. A typical modern desktop computer will consume 20 watts when in idle mode, between 2 and 5 watts in energy saving mode, and around 1 watt when turned off. 
LCD monitors will consume approximately 20 watts when in use and less than a watt in standby, dependent on the size and the type. As well as manually switching off computers and monitors at the end of the day, energy saving settings can be applied to shut them down after a period of inactivity. This can either be carried out manually on each computer or applied centrally via the server. In the case of server control, you can purchase power management software that allows you to program the power on and off times of your PCs at any time of the day. Photocopiers and printers. Typically, a small to medium sized colour photocopier will use between 300 and 1500 watts when in use <coughs> and up to 250 watts when in standby. Installing a seven day time switch with an override facility will ensure that the machine is switched off during out of hours periods whilst the override allows for working outside office hours. Printers, as with other devices, can be switched off when not in use. Servers. Servers generally need to be on 24 hours a day. Investigative old servers could be replaced with more energy efficient examples, whilst also considering if you can rationalise their number. Over the last couple of years, a number of innovations have helped to reduce the need for on-site servers. Consult an IT support engineer to see if they can advise you on implementing virtual servers and cloud computing. Kitchen facilities. But water boilers, water coolers and other kitchen equipment should all be switched off when possible. In the case of hot water boilers and water coolers, this might only be practical over the weekend or holiday periods. This is the end of the office and IT equipment energy saving video. Remember to Set up energy saving and shut down settings on your computers. Focus on switching off other non-essential electrical equipment. Consider energy efficiency when upgrading your equipment, using energy efficiency standards as a guide. That's just one of several videos available from the Carbon Trust. They're well worth a look at. At the cost of repeating myself, they seem to be at the forefront of trying to at least offer some assistance or guidance to, to industry and here in the UK. Uh, good videos. That one came off, off um, YouTube. We now get to the bit where we've had no electricity, we've got some that's going to cost us more, but now we've got some electricity that's going to cost us a lot. This really, really is a tragic story. Um, again, what's behind the headlines? Um, Simon Lyons was 20. He was travelling down the A49 with his father. Uh, if you live in a rural area, it's not uncommon to see a single cable uh, across a wooden pole going to an outbuilding or a, or a property. Um, what had happened was the cable was sagging on the road. Mr. Lyons got out as the good Samaritan. He wanted nothing more because he recognised the hazard. This was an overhead cable. I suspect he knew it was a, a, a one carrying electricity, unlike the one I mentioned before, which was a catenary just carrying data, which we nearly lost at border. And basically stood by the side of the road, uh, waving at the traffic to try and slow it down. Unfortunately, a van came by, struck the cable, and the cable came free. And then a car went over the cable, and the cable whipped up, and it hit Mr. Lines. Um, unfortunately, he didn't die instantly through electric shock. He died later on in hospital through serious burns. Uh, this poor guy, in his 20s, was acting as the Good Samaritan. He recognised the hazard. He was trying to prevent, and he was the one, unfortunately, who was the result of the harm. Um, this, the full story behind it, um, he, Scottish Power fined £130 um, for not maintaining their network. Uh, the cable had been attached to a building via a wooden block, a block that had been there 30 years. Poor maintenance led to the block disintegrating, it lost its anchorage, and that's why it had sag. We know about the dangers of electricity. It's sad that it, anyone, who, particularly a good Samaritan, should die, be, be a fatality um, through its, it, it, its use when it's, it's there all the time. It's in solid. He, he didn't come into contact with a high voltage cable. This was just 230 volts, the type of stuff available on the sockets on the wall. Just as a refresher, as you're all health and safety professionals, apart from Haswa, which sits at the top line, this is my interpretation, and this is a level of the kind of information that's already out there from the HSC and other, other bodies. Clearly the thing that sits under has were electricity work regs, 1989. A very slim document, I have to say. 
And the date tells you something about it. It came rather late on. Um, but we already had very, very high standards here in the UK, courtesy of this thing. The Institute of Electrical Engineers had had a standard in terms of electrical distribution and use since the 1890s, and it's been there <laughs> a long time. By compliance with this standard, which effectively regulates the standard that electrical supplies are installed in uh, commercial and domestic properties up to 1,000 volts AC, if you comply with this, the reason this is such a slim document means you've complied with that. And it tells you that. It's in there. This tends to be more in the hands of the electrical installer. It's a sort of document that if you, if you had a bath in your bathroom and you wanted an electric shower, and you brought in an electrician, this is the document he's going to go to to get the sort of guidelines on the cable size and the fuse capacity to do the installation. He's also going to take guidance from that about the earthing and how to make it safe. He's not going to find it in here. Underneath the IEE British Standard 7671, so it's another fine document called the Code of Practice for Inspection and Test. This is the thing that drives pack testing along, by the way. If you're ever confused or you want to know, what does drive PAT? It's two things. It's the IE Code of Practice in conjunction with Regulation 4 of the Electricity at Work Regs, which says systems must be maintained. But this is the one that's eminently readable. It's not cheap. It's £40 to buy. You don't need to buy it. You can get this version of it, which effectively is a much more readable version of this. So if you've got PAT testing going on at your place of work, or you're considering it, discount this, it's not going to tell you anything. That's for the hands of the technical people. That's the one you should really get hold of, but actually you can get that one for nothing. None of these start telling you, by the way, about the dangers or the hazards of electricity. They're more pertinent about how, how, just it's safe, how to use it safely. You then have another raft of publications from the HSC. These are the ones that now start warning you of the hazards. What potentially can happen if it goes wrong? What are the safe systems of work? How do you set up a permit to work? The top one, Electricity Work, Safe Work and Practices, HSG 85. Very good document. Goes hand in hand with the Electricity Work regs. The next two pretty much tell you avoidance of danger from overhead electric power lines and shock horror safe working near overhead power lines. Hang on a minute. This all seems to be to do with high voltage. Poor Mr. Lyons died of an overhead catenary that came down that only contained 230 volts. But we knew about that. Because you get to a document that the HSE also give you for free. And it's called Avoidance of dangers from underground services. And I've lifted out, one, the front page of the paper. And it's a, I presume it's a mock-up. It's a not an untypical site of a work person digging a trench to expose a cable. And they've been caught in what's called an arc fire blast. We know about these because in this free document here, paragraph 9 tells us all about it. Injuries are usually caused by the explo explosive effect. It's electricity. I did start this presentation by telling, you it was a, by telling you it was a source of energy. Yes, electricity can explode. The effects of are in current and by associated fire or flames, which may result when a live cable penetrated by a sharp object, such as the point of a tool, front cover, example, such effects can also occur when a cable is crushed severely enough to cause internal contact between the conductors or between metallic, sh metallic sheathing and one or more conductors. And then we get to the bit, the court Mr. Lines. Injuries are typically severe, potentially fatal, burns to hands, face and body, electric shock is less likely. Crumbs. And now we discovered in this document, and I didn't put these in any particular order, although I did rank, obviously from under Haswell, where the electricity work regs should sit. The rest are just either codes of practice or guidance notes. You have to get to this document before the science behind, if you like, what Ray calls the mischief is really revealed. I'm just going to show you a short video. Set the scene first. It's not a mock-up. Some of you may have seen it before. It's two technicians in a power intake room in Germany in 2010. This is the sort of place we broke into and bought a TV to knock a hole in a wall.
This is the equivalent of the cupboard under the stairs where your fuse box would be, but it's on an industrial scale. And there's no rule of thumb as to the size of area this may occupy. If you do electroplating and you've only got six employees, you might actually have a power intake room or this size, it's big. And why? Because your electricity consumption level is high. Electroplating takes a very high amount of energy to make it work. This is where you're dipping metals in baths of nasty substances, passing a high current through them and getting a metal on metal to stick. People can remember back to the time when motor cars had chrome bumpers. This was a big industry. Because to get chrome to stick to steel, you have to make a layer of copper stick to the steel first and then you apply the chrome. And the, reason, the, the method of doing both of those was actually to take the steel bumper, lower it into a tank of copper something or other sulfates, pass a current through it, the copper sticks to it, and then you put in another bath of chemicals, pass a current through it, and it becomes chrome plated. So as a rule of thumb, I suspect this was a, a, a 200 plus employees, but it would largely depend what their operations were. If they're power presses, if they're smelting iron, or they're doing something which is consuming large amounts, the workforce level not, might not be high. But it invariably, the, a room which just is a large version of the cupboard under the stairs. These two net technicians were up to something and I don't know what because the results of the inquiry haven't been released yet. Electricity explodes, we've seen it. This document here warned us, potentially fatal burns to the hands, face, body, and electric shock is less likely. You saw the technician, worst place possible. The flash was where his hands and his face was, and he was half inside the cabinet he was working on. It looked a safe environment. Bit of science, we understand what went on there, but it's worth knowing. It's just worth understanding what happens in an arc flashover, and it's quite simple. So you have a conductor, or you have a cable that has three conductors in it. Everybody there are two phases that are alive and a neutral and an earth. There could be a three-phase supply at a higher voltage, but we'll take it that it's a single-phase supply. It's not an uncommon accident, this. Uh, if you go on YouTube, you can see quite a few examples. This is, the, this is what happened in that incident. There's been a short. There's been a short between a live conductor and earth, or a short between the live and neutral that shouldn't be there generally through the slip of a tool. A spade in the ground goes through a cable, or the technician slips with a screwdriver. The technician slips with a screwdriver, which was the easier example. If you've got the two conductors that are well separated and insulated, you have a short circuit. That short circuit causes a very high rush of current very quickly. That very high rush of electrical current through the screwdriver causes several things to happen. The screwdriver heats up. The screwdriver moves on to the next level from heating up, it melts. It moves on to the next level because the current is still flowing and the screwdriver and the contacts it's across start to burn. The burning causes heat to rise and the rise of heat takes metal particles up into the cloud. It's called a plasma. If the technician has the foresight to try and get the short circuit out of the way, get the spade out of the way, the current still flows. What they now know is the short circuit can be removed, but the current is still flowing courtesy of the metal, metal particles now suspended in, in the atmosphere. Unfortunately, the technician's trapped in a conductive soup. So it happens very quick. Slip of two, contact. Rush of current, heating up. Burning. Burning causes gases to rise. Gases rise. Short circuit may come off or not. Current still flows. If the short circuit is removed, the actual electrical contacts or the cable themselves start to burn and they add to it. It builds up into a conductive soup. You get an explosion. It happens very fast. Now I've explained the science, I'm just going to show you the video again because it's kind of scary. 
once it's been explained to you what's happening, you can see it. First you see a, a flash, then you see the burn and the blast and the shock wave, and then just like November the 5th using sparklers, you see the metal particles falling to the ground, still glowing, and the technician is somewhere in the middle of it. That was an arc flashover blast. I don't know the voltage. The inquiry hasn't come up with it. The HSE use it on the front cover of this document here. It's the one that you need to get to. It doesn't give a lot away. It's much better understood. YouTube actually have up on there, if you put that in and try and find some extra videos, there's an American lab have done some experiments where they've, they've put dummy technicians in front of cab metal cabinets and deliberately set the blast off. Clearly, it's a subject we need to take serious. Mr. Lyons got caught, he was severely burned and unfortunately he died. I just want to end on one final, because this was another headline that caught my attention. This, this one, by all accounts, was ridiculous and should never have happened. Um, Jonathan Crosby, 45, worked as an overhead electrical linesman. Ooh, that's interesting. Overhead electrical linesman should be a competent person. He must have some understanding of electrical systems. He must have under some understanding of the systems he's working on. He was asked to do a fairly simple job, remove a transformer. Next time you're traveling in a rural area, and you'll see those wooden poles that are part of the lower voltage electrical distribution system. Just have a second look, because sometimes you will see near the top of those wooden poles, a metal cabinet, that's the transformer. That's a big version, basically, people, of the thing you charge your phone with. So if I said to you, pick up your mobile phone charger, you plug it into something, 230 volts, and it transforms it into a voltage like six volts that allows you to charge your phone. These ones on wooden poles are doing exactly the same job, but at a higher voltage. They're transforming a high voltage, either 11,000 volts, down to 415 volts, or 415 volts, down to 230 volts. Looked a fairly simple job. There, there's hundreds of them distributed around the country. Get up the wooden pole and take the transformer down. So they put him in a cherry picker, lifted him up. And what they hadn't told Mr. Crosby was the overhead lines were still alive. They killed him. He was in a metal bucket. Nobody told him. It went to court. EDF were fined half a million pounds. Mr. Lyons lost his life. Young lad at 20. Crumbs, you've even got 100,000 pounds. I'll let you make the judgment. Went to court. Investigation by the HSC found the UK Power Networks failed to cut the electricity supply by removing the fuses from the transformer. Crumbs, they just put them in a metal bucket and took them up there and said, take that down. Nobody checked it. HSC inspector Tony Dewey revealed there was no safe system of work, staff had not received proper training, and there was inadequate supervision of the operation. EDF are one of the major distributors of high voltage in this country. The thing to remember is on pylons, that's the big metal giants that march across the countryside, they're carrying 440,000 volts, and the people who put Mr. Crosby in a bucket hadn't done the basics. Three sets of headlines, electricity, loss, whether it's due to inclement weather, accidents or flooding, it's worth thinking about. What would you do in that predicament? How would your particular industry or sector cope with it? Cost of electricity. You've already seen the forecast. It's going up and it's not likely to go down. But you can take some measures to help yourself. And just be aware there's some big fines out there. And even the people who you would think um, would have more respect for the energy source they're handling are having accidents. Been appreciative audience. Thanks for asking. Thank you.